First one up, we'll take the number one photograph, and this is from the Spanish-American War. See it on the screen right there. Mm -hmm. What's this all about? Well, this was a photograph of probably, it looks like a, a heap of laundry, but it's really one of the most famous photographs in the Spanish-American War. It's the picture of two dead Rough Riders. And your viewers may recall that Theodore Roosevelt was probably the most famous of the Rough Riders. It's, it's the role that propelled him into the White House. And the man on the left, you can barely see he's got hobnail boots um, sticking out from under those blankets, the, is a man named Hamilton Fish, Jr. And his father was Secretary of State under uh, Grant, I believe. Uh, he had volunteered for the war, volunteered and anyway, had been killed in the very first battle uh, that the Rough Riders were in. The reason why this, this photograph is particularly important is, one, because it depicts, <laughs> as much as you can see it, the, the body of uh, probably the most famous person who was killed during the war. But it's also, I think, an indication of how the photographers felt about the men who were killed during the war. Often we tend to think about wars in cliches. World War I was the war to end all wars and so forth. Well, the, the litany for the Spanish-American War was, was a war for duty and destiny. And the sense, it was probably actually the most popular war in American history, more popular than even in World War II. And the sense was that this was everyone's chance for, for glory. Uh, and when the photographers went to Cuba to photograph the war, they took photographs that protected the soldiers' nobility. They didn't want to show pictures of men bloodied by combat. This particular photograph, that particular photograph of the two bodies under the heaps of blankets, the photographer who took that made the conscious choice. Um, he covered the bodies up um, and made the conscious choice to, to photograph them that way so the viewers at home, his audience, uh, wouldn't be able to gawk. That war lasted how many days? Boy, just a couple weeks. Let's look at photograph number three. All right. This is a, uh, this is actually photograph, up oh, there's photograph number, number two. This is the now, same. Is this number three in the book? This is number three in the yeah, book. okay. This is those same two bodies uh, in the foreground there. Again, you can see sort of the man's hobnail boots sticking out from one of the blankets. In the background is a circle of officers. This is taking place before another battle. And the man in the sort of the dark shirt, he's got suspenders on the far right is Theodore Roosevelt. This was a photograph that was not allowed to be published. And the reason why is because in this photograph you see men talking and laughing as if the two dead boys don't exist. And that was considered to be unthinkable, that you didn't, um, you had respect for the dead. Let's look at photograph number seven. All right. Could we please have photograph number seven? This is a, a sort of a classic war photograph. I think many of us, when we think of wars in, in, in years gone by, maybe we've seen movies from, uh, of Waterloo or whatever, the, the Civil War. And this is what we think of. We think of cannons and billowing smoke this is a, a picture uh, from one of the artillery engagements during uh, the war. Uh, the big wagon wheel you see is, is attached to a cannon, and the reason why everything is so light in the sort of upper right is because it's, it's the billowing, billowing cannons, cannon smoke. And this is, I think, indicative of the kind of photograph that the, the photographers wanted to take. It was a rom very romantic view of war. But perhaps the other reason to mention it is because the only images of combat that really exist for the Spanish-American War. You have to remember that at this point, there was, the camera equipment was very slow, was very large, and it didn't have the kind of fast film 
and perhaps long lenses that, that we are used to now. So there are no pictures of Theodore Roosevelt charging up the San Juan Hills. There are no pictures of uh, men jumping out of trenches or whatever. The only photographs we have that one could consider combat are those of sort of cannons firing. How many photographers did you find that, that were involved in, world, in, in the Spanish-American War? More than you might think. Uh, I think it was, hmm, uh, I remember there were, there were a couple, probably a couple hundred, uh, but of those, I, and I, I may be misstating, I'm, I'm not sure I remember my own facts here, but of that number, as was true for all wars, even though there may be a lot of photographers, only a handful were really critical. Uh, there were very few outlets for photography. As I mentioned, it was a very new technological phenomenon. And so the outlets for photographers were really in cities like New York. Now, the three photographs we saw were all taken by the same photographer? No. Uh, two, the first two were taken by one photographer. And Burr McIntosh? Burr McIntosh, yes. Mm -hmm. Anything interesting about him? Uh, well, not especially, except he was one of the first photographers to come down with yellow fever. Uh, there are many more soldiers who were killed during the Spanish-American War because of yellow fever uh, than because of the actual combat injuries. Uh, and the reason why he came down with yellow fever is that when the uh, the troop ships arrived off the coast of Cuba, the correspondents were not allowed to go on shore with the troops. And Burr McIntosh wanted to get a photograph of the men striding ashore. And he smuggled his cameras into one of the men's boats and, uh, and had them row his cameras ashore. And then he dove over the deck and swam into shore, not realizing how far he was out and also that the undertow was going the wrong direction. By the time he got into shore, uh, he was pretty exhausted and uh, his health was more or less shot. So he was a prime candidate for coming down with, uh, with fever. The last uh, photo that we just saw was William Denwoodies, I believe. Mm -hmm. And who was he? Uh, I probably know less about him. He, on the other hand, was, was one of the, the better photographers of the war um, and was photographer that was used both in, I think, some of the major magazines like Scribner's and Harper's and so forth. What happened to photography between 1898 and, and uh, the beginning of uh, World War II? What was it, about 1916? World War I. I mean, World War I, I'm sorry. Well, cameras got slightly smaller, slightly faster, but it was more, less the technology, although that was important, but more that the photographers had learned how to photograph war. Right after the Spanish-American War, there were several other national conflict or international conflicts. There was the uh, the Boer War, the Russo-Japanese War, uh, Boxer Rebellion. So photographers were sort of jaunting around the world, and and they realized that they could not use the large format cameras that they had taken to the Spanish-American War. Many of them. Can you show us, with using your hands, how big that camera was in the Spanish-American War? Well. Many of the photographers in the Spanish-American War used an eight by, a camera that took 8 by 10 negatives. So just think of an you know, 8 and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It was more or less that size. Not only that, but there were glass plates. So you can imagine how careful someone had to be. And also, if you're carrying 20 glass plates, how heavy that was. So what the photographers had learned between the Spanish-American War and World War I was that it was just untenable to carry that large a camera. And what they really needed to do was go down to the smaller format cameras, which, which were available. Uh, the largest would be 5x7 and more to be uh, sort of even smaller, maybe um, sort of index card size. Let's take a look at some of the photos from World War I. And mm -hmm. the first one up, I believe, is photo number 11. This is a photograph of, an, uh, of a burial of an American officer. There you can see the, the casket covered with the stars and stripes, and there are sort of funereal wreaths uh, in front of the, the coffin. Uh, 
honor guard standing behind it. This was the burial of one of the, the first men killed after the United States entered the war, which was, of course, in 1917. The reason for this, for, for showing this picture, is to demonstrate the absolute blanket censorship that was in, in operation during World War I. There was, throughout the entire war, from 14 to 18, uh, it was not allowed, you were not allowed to show any pictures of American dead or even of the Allied dead, any pictures of American wounded, unless the wounded were receiving, receiving aid and unless they were totally cleaned up. In other words, you could not show pictures with, with blood, with people with perhaps a missing limb or so. Uh, you also saw very few pictures of combat. Uh, most of the pictures were, as I said, absolutely, absolutely censored. The idea being that none of the, the powers that be, whether they would be American or, or French or even the, the central powers, Germany, Austria, and so forth, wanted to inform the public at home exactly what was happening on the fighting front. As, you, as we all know from, from hindsight, how, how, how absolutely bloody a war it was. Well, as you can imagine, the concern of the military authorities was that if the public at home saw exactly what was happening on the fighting front, that all support for the war effort would totally dis dissipate. Cadel and uh, Herbert, the name of the, the uh, two photographers that took that picture? No, Cadel and Herbert, uh, like another group called Underwood and Underwood, are, are two of the most prominent uh, picture agencies that were in existence. Most of the photographs are anonymous, or anonymous in as much as we don't know who took the pictures. Uh, that was another effect of the censorship, that you didn't know who took the pictures. The pictures that did appear in the publications were released often months after the event uh, they pictured. And the captions themselves were very obscure, would never identify uh, an individual officer would never identify an individual place. You would not see Americans with the Eiffel Tower in the background because they didn't want to show that Americans were in Paris, for example. Next uh, photo is uh, 17, Underwood and Underwood Agency. What's this? Oh, I think this is one of the, the, the sort of humorous, quietly humorous photographs of the war. This is, uh, I believe, titled something to the effect of uh, Americans ready for a gas attack. Uh, they look like bugs, but they're wearing gas masks. And this was an example of the kind of photography, the kind of photographs that was passed off as combat photographs. Uh, to us, it looks like if you take their masks away, they're posing for some sort of high school yearbook. Uh, it doesn't look like they're anywhere near ready to go into combat. But this was about as close to the, the fighting lines as uh, we saw during the war itself. Next uh, photo was in Saturday Evening Post, uh, October 9th, 1918, another Underwood and Underwood uh, photo, and we ought to have it up here. If we don't, I show. I don't think we have it ready. Let's look at it here in the book that I've got. Uh, here we go. Yeah, this is, I think, one of the the best and most successful pictures of the war. Uh, I think this is the way that we, as historians, uh, or we as as uh, as learning from history, think about World War One. We think of men going over the top, men going over there, um, laden down with the sort of knapsacks and, and, and the guns and the, those funny little bulge-shaped helmets. But this was not, as I sort of said before, this is not indicative of the photographs uh, from the war. It's, it's an anomaly that we saw anything, as I said, again, this close to the front or, or even this compositionally well, uh, well contrived. If uh, our audience has just joined us, I want to tell them who we're talking with and what we're talking about. It's a book called Shooting War. It looks like this, and its author is Susan Moeller. And we're talking about uh, photography, war photography from five wars, Spanish-American War, World War I, which we just completed, uh, and we have three wars to go. Which was your favorite war from a photography standpoint? I think it would have to be either World War II or or Vietnam, uh, because I think the photographs from those wars were the most outstanding. Uh, 
And also, I, because there were, the, there were also the wars, well, World War I, or World War II, rather, was the war in which I was able to begin to interview some of the photographers themselves. Uh, so it's always more interesting, not only when I can look at the photographs as they appeared, but can say, all right, Mr. Carl Mydens, uh, how did you take this picture and what were you thinking of? Did you talk to anybody who was a photographer in the Spanish-American War? No, actually, while I was writing the Spanish-American War, the very last survivor, who was not a photographer, but was um, some uh, teenager who had lied his way into to fighting the Spanish-American War, he died at the age of 109, and he died while I was writing that chapter. How about World War I? Anybody that was a photographer in World War I you've been able to talk to? I did to? talk to... Uh, a couple of the photographers who were in the Signal Corps uh, photographic division, and many of the photographs from, well, from all the wars, uh, were military photographers. Uh, many of the even the, the civilian publications, uh, whether it be the New York Times or or uh, Time and Newsweek, did use military uh, photography. Um, and I did in, this, in World War One talk to some of the military photographers, but. As far as I know, all the civilian photographers had, had died by the time that I was writing the book.